Hello there and welcome to chapter 10. Today we're talking all about land, both public and private. We'll be talking about a lot of super fun government policies. Uh, get buckled up. I hope it means that this one's not going to be super long, but uh, let's see what happens. All right. So first thing, we're actually circling way back to the very beginning of the year, which is when we talked about the tragedy of the commons. This was our happy fishing activity when you guys fought for the colored marshmallows or goldfish. Um, but kind of just bringing that back, this is our formal uh, definition of it. So when we're thinking about the tragedy of the commons, this is the tendency of a shared that keyword being shared, limited resources become depleted. This often happens because individuals are not really thinking about maybe, hey, a lot of people are using this resource, or maybe there's not regulations in place to promote the sharing of that resource. But um, if we're if there's no regulations, if we're all acting in our own self-interest, we're thinking, hey, I want to get the best bang for the buck. I want to use this resource to make the greatest profit. Then oftentimes those shared resources, if everyone's acting in the same way, if we're all trying to use the resource to the best of its abilities to help ourselves, then that resource becomes depleted. We got a visual of that. So oftentimes whenever things are used below the carrying capacity, which means we're using it at a rate that that resource is able to still replenish, we're not over depleting a resource. Uh, you can also think about that biological capacity versus that ecological footprint from earlier this year. So oftentimes uh, natural things are going to be able to be replenished. I mean, that's kind of the nature of Earth, right? Things are always going to be recycling and then replenishing themselves unless we end up using it beyond that amount. So when we begin using things beyond the carrying capacity, if we're over depleting, if we're over utilizing those resources, then we're going to be um, kind of seeing some more environmental costs. So oftentimes the land can be degraded. And ha, ha, not I can no longer be used. That's supposed to say it can no longer be used. Ha, 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 ha. Bringing this also into more things about chapter 10, we can think about these things as externalities. We've kind of been throwing this word out around a little bit. Um, but externalities, think about that key, that root of this word, which is external. These are some sort of outside costs that we don't physically, monetarily pay for. So, for example, um, let's say I buy a T-shirt and I pay. It, it's a really good deal for this T-shirt. I get five dollars for this T-shirt. I'm really excited about you know five dollar T-shirt. Um, but an externality that could occur could be an increased amount of air pollution from the factory that manufactured my T-shirt. I am not monetarily paying for the air pollution, but I'm paying for it in other ways, right? That air pollution from the factory that produced my t-shirt is now, especially if it's a greenhouse gas, could lead to greater global warming, deteriorating the quality of the world itself. So that is an externality. It's more of an environmental cost that I'm not paying for in the good uh, or the price of the good. Now, we could if we want to try to make things more legit and try to factor those in, we could actually take the environmental cost of things and then factor that into the price of the good. But uh, if we're now adding in costs for things, that's going to increase the price of the good. And a lot of people don't really like that. But kind of think about the tragedy of the common, the deterioration of the land, the degradation of the land, if people are overusing it, that's going to be an externality that you don't monetarily pay for. I guess, though, you would eventually if your profits start going down because you don't have enough food or crops being produced, let's say if it's a cropland, uh, but it's not one that I'm paying for in the moment mon monetarily. We can also begin to think about um, or tie this into something known as maximum sustainable yield. Uh, maximum sustainable yield, if we break that down, maximum, greatest amount, sustainable, long-term, right? How are we able to try to provide for those future generations? And then yield is how much um, crops or how much goods are being produced per a certain, uh, well, you can do square meter or you can do acre. It depends on, anyways, in a given area, how much goods am I producing in that given area? Thinking about externalities, thinking about tragedy to commons, thinking about how much food we're going to be needing and also tying it in from something from populations is our carrying capacity. As a reminder, the carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals that can be sustained in a given area based on the amount of resources, habitat space, um, food, water, shelter, and also the number of predators. We as humans don't really need to worry too much about predators unless you're swimming in an open ocean. I don't know, I'm afraid of sharks. Uh, but the main things that we're worrying about in carrying capacity is how much space, right? How much land is available, and then also how much food as well. So as our human population is increasing, at some point we will reach something known as a maximum sustainable yield. And that's also something we want to be aware of in thinking about future generations as well. Carrying capacity, right, there's only so much food I can create in a given area, but then thinking about uh, technically we could create more than that, right? We can exceed that carrying capacity, but when you exceed the carrying capacity, then you begin worrying about 
is this land being degraded? Is this land, are we now over depleting? Are we overdrawing from these resources and we're drawing them at a greater rate than they're able to replenish? Then we start worrying about, is this sustainable? Is this long-term? Can we keep going at this rate? So the maximum sustainable yield ends up kind of capping. Yes, we can grow more. Yes, we can use that land at a greater amount, but we don't want to exceed the maximum sustainable yield because we want to make sure that that land replenishes for future generations. Cool beans on that? All right. Whew, there's a lot of stuff on here. I'm not going to read through every single one, but you should know that we have something known as public lands versus private lands. So our public lands, oftentimes when we're thinking about essentially like shared areas, something that no one individual owns, but maybe an organization owns, maybe um, an establishment, or maybe the entire state of Texas, let's say, um, owns these areas. So national parks is one that I always think about, right? The country or an organization owns these, right? But no one individual owns them, but they're not private lands. Um, so usually our national parks, our protected resources areas, our species management, our wilderness areas, these are gonna be the ones, uh, if you think about those zones, zones of biosphere, ooh, that's not the right, ah, I don't remember the exact word, but we had like the protected zone where no one could go in except for researchers. And then we had uh, the zone outside of that. Wow, I'm so sorry that my brain is not working, but that was when like people could go parks, but like you couldn't build a Walmart there. And then we had our least protected areas. Anyways, our strict nature reserve, that these are gonna be protected areas where we're monitoring some species, but really only the select few individuals can actually go in there. Similarly, we also have that for our aquatic ecosystems as well and national monuments as well. So these are areas pretty much anyone can vote or anyone can um, visit except for really these many, middle two, those are kind of protected areas, uh, but no one individual owns those. When we're thinking about the whole United States of America, look at it, it's so beautiful, so patriotic, wow. Okay, so when we're looking at all this, we can kind of see a lot of it, especially it's gonna be in this light green, these are forest areas. Uh, we'll talk about timber development in just a little bit. We also see a big one is land management. So again, for more protected areas, Florida Defense is another big one. Um, and we also have, these are gonna be kind of a lot of our protected and or public areas on here. When we're thinking about whole United States of America, big old US of A, and we're thinking about what is actually being utilized for what, how are we using this land? Number one, this is really important, number one on the list is grazing land and grassland. So our crops and our livestock is gonna be number one. And if we think about it, um, our grazing, oops, sorry, crops are ugh, number three. Grazing land is gonna be mostly for our livestock, right? We see the, the roaming buffaloes going through the prairie fields, cool beans. Um, grassland for our cows used primarily for livestock and for food production. Cropland is number three, again, feeding not only ourselves, but then also feeding our primary consumers, those livestock, such as the chicken and the cows that could later become a food source for humans. Number two is timber production, um, not only thinking about logging for building things, but then also supplying our paper goods as well. And we're gonna be looking in particular at timber production in just a little bit, but I would know that grazing land grassland is number one. Kind of uh, another word for grazing land, grassland is going to be our rangelands. Again, these are going to be open areas primarily, uh, especially when we're thinking about in contrast to our CAFOs, which we'll talk about in um, chapter 11, which is our concentrated animal feeding operations. These are going to be kind of more of those large scale, more open range, free range um, cattle production as opposed to forest, which is number two, number two for our land use. Um, primarily going to be woody vegetation that we'll be using extracting to obtain timber goods. So let's talk about timber production right now. There's two main ways that we're gonna be harvesting um, timber. As always, right? there's one that's cheaper and then there's one for, that's better for the environment. So we're gonna be kind of talking about that. Two main ways of harvesting that timber. One of them is gonna be clear cutting and the other one is selective cutting. Clear cutting, as the name sounds, it's just let's raise down all the trees in this one particular area. Selective cutting, uh, it's right here on B. We're picking individual trees and only harvesting those individual trees. Okay, so let's talk about pros and cons of both of these. You should know not only the uh, definition of these two, but you also really need to know the pros and cons, the cost and benefits of each of these. So let's talk about clear cutting first. First of all, pros. It's super cheap, right? You can just go in there. It's very time efficient as well. When you cut down all the trees in one area, you're really able to kind of knock it out in a much shorter time frame than you would in selective cutting. You're also able to kind of 
go like row by row through the trees. So you don't have to build roads to get into the deep heart of the forest. You're really able to just kind of cut down trees in one area. So very good for the wallet, right? For the pocketbook. Bad for the environment though, there's a couple cons with clear cutting. One of those is going to be increased amount of soil erosion. So when you don't have those tree roots that are kind of holding down all those roots and plates, then you're gonna have an increased amount of soil erosion. Also with the removal of trees, now we don't have as much of a barrier blocking the sunlight, which means that you're also gonna have an increased amount of water temperatures. If we have a lot of aquatic organisms that are sensitive to dramatic changes in temperature that could be detrimental to them. Um, thirdly, yes, we could regrow our trees, right? But now all my trees are gonna be uniform. So I have a decreased amount of biodiversity. Um, I don't have all these big trees and small trees. Now it's kind of a cookie cutter forest. And with that decreased biodiversity, this forest is gonna be less resilient. You're gonna have less animals and less other species in this area when we clear cut. So second option, right, is selective cutting. We're picking out individual trees. As you can imagine, this is a much more expensive option because um, now it takes a lot longer, takes a lot more effort, and you're also now having to build roads to get into the heart of the forest. If I'm not clearing the trees off row by row, now I need to find some way to actually get to one tree to another. So much more expensive for the pocketbook. However, much better for the environment. You don't have the same cons of uh, those increased water temperatures. You don't have as much soil erosion um, and you don't have that uniform forest as well. So much better for biodiversity and much better for the resilience and resistance of that ecosystem in case of a future natural disaster. This is gonna be much better for us. Cool beans. Oh, wow, we got joke, joke, joke. Hey, look, but at least his allergies are gone. What a joy. <laughs> All right. One more. So when we were talking about ah, selective cutting, that is going to be what we call sustainable forestry technique, something that's going to help that forest last a lot longer. Uh, fire management prescribed birds in particular is another way that we um, can try to help that forest live a much longer time than it would ordinarily. So Forest fires, natural fires are a natural part of our world, right? They're going to be increased by certain anthropogenic sources, but in general, forest fires are going to happen. They've been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years, even before humans were here. So one thing, though, as humans become more and more involved with these forest trees, and as we're making different changes to our environmental conditions, prescribed burns can try to mitigate or decrease the ne negative effects of a forest fire. So essentially this is prescribed, right? A prescription, it's controlled burn. So essentially we're intentionally setting a fire to one area of the forest. They usually rotate different parts of the forest, but why in the world would we be intentionally setting things on fire? Well, there's two main benefits to this. Um, I guess three really. One of them is that we are decreasing the negative effects of a future natural forest fire. Lots of times forests on the forest floor, they're gonna have lots of pine needles, lots of dead leaves, lots of what we would call leaf litter and debris. And those are incredibly flammable. Think about any time that you've ever put a pile of pine needles in an open fire. If you've ever done that as a kid, they're like, ah, they incinerate immediately. So think about like, that's like pure fuel for a forest fire. So if we can try to kind of set those on fire, clear them out intentionally in a controlled way, that's gonna decrease the ability of a natural forest fire to spread deliberately, okay? So that's benefit number one, we're decreasing future effects of a forest fire. Number two, it's also controlled succession. We are providing new growth. We are providing a kind of a fresh start in a controlled way for a forest. Number three, there are actually certain seeds that rely and require fire to actually develop and bud. So if I'm able to actually deliberately set fire, now these seeds are able to sprout and we're able to have that new growth in this forest. So those are our three main benefits for prescribed berms, for decreasing the detriments of a future forest fire, we're allowing for succession to happen in a controlled fashion, and we're also allowing those fire dependent seeds to actually sprout. A couple of things we should know when we're thinking about our natural for national forest, man, we're still talking about trees, yay. There's three main kind of categories that we can put a forest in. Some of them are going to be national parks. Again, these are going to be overseen by the government and our national park services. Um, we'll also have refugees for wildlife as well. Refugees? Refuges? I cannot say that word. Pretend like I didn't. I don't teach English. That's okay. <laughs> so when we're actually focusing on protecting wildlife rather than 
kind of providing that aesthetic beauty that national parks do. These are going to be our refugees. And then we also have wilderness areas. These are going to be kind of preserving things. They don't have as much availability for guests to view as opposed to like a national park, but you are able to visit these a lot more than you could for a wildlife refugee. But I would know those three distinctions for our national forests. Ooh, we're almost done talking about trees and parks. Yay! We got to talk about federal regulations. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So I'm not going to go into these super, super in detail, but you should know that there's three main regulations that are essentially going to be protect protecting these projects and their, these environmental national protected areas. We're going to have mitigation plans, trying to figure out, okay, in the event of emergency, how are we going to be able to decrease those negative um, detriments to the environment? How are we going to able to kind of decrease um, the risk factor for that? We'll also have the environmental impact statement, which is whenever we're looking at the actual or project, projecting a future project um, for beautifying a neighborhood or for beautifying a park or for even creating a new park, what is going to be the scope and purpose of that? I don't know why I went from the bottom to the top, my apologies, but number one on there is our National Environmental Policy Act, the NEPA or the NEPA. Whenever we're actually assessing our projects, we're essentially, this is gonna be figuring out, okay, what money do we have? What permits do we need in order to create a new protected wildlife or environmental area? We got a joke as, this is not a joke, but it's just a funny picture. All right, we're moving to our third and final part of chapter 10, which is talking about residential land use. Okay, trying to watch the time as well. Urban, suburban, rural are three types of land, right? I think a lot of us are really familiar with urban versus rural. We've been talking about that since elementary school, right? Rural is going to be kind of open areas, um, very sparsely populated compared to an urban area, which is very densely concentrated individuals in an area. But then something that kind of arose really in the last century is going to be our sub our suburbs, essentially, our suburban areas, which is areas surrounding our urban areas. They have lower population densities, but we're seeing this really crazy thing that's happening, especially here in Houston, which is where we are, right? Um, in our urban areas, our suburbs are actually becoming almost as densely populated as a lot of major cities around the world. So we're, I mean, Houston is just, I mean, it's a huge case study. So we're going to get into that. One thing that you should know is how our suburbs really have been created is through something known as urban sprawl. Whenever we have an urban area that's spreading out and creating suburbs, essentially leaching into what we would know as our rural area, we call that urban sprawl. There's four main things that are kind of leading into, but then also our concerns that come from urban sprawl. One of those is our automobiles and highway construction. We're going to talk about the highway trust fund in just a little bit and how does that negatively impact our, our urban areas. But automobiles is going to be that main thing that has led to this urban sprawl. When we had cars, now you don't have to live within three miles of everything that you need. Um, now, as a Houstonian, if I want to go to Trader Joe's in the Woodlands, I can just hop in my car or, or go there or go to Costco in Cyprus, right? I'm able to reach these areas a lot more. So I can kind of move out, right? I don't have to be in the city center. I can move into a suburb now. Living costs, um, things are a lot cheaper outside of the city. So more and more people are gonna be leaving the cities and going to the suburbs because it's a lot more affordable. I know a lot of people actually in Los Angeles are now moving to Houston and Austin because it's a lot cheaper than living in California. Although California is absolutely beautiful. 10 out of 10 recommend. Another thing that's going to be leading or coming from urban sprawl is going to be urban blight. We're going to hold on to that for a second because I really want to focus on urban blight. But essentially, it's the deterioration of a city area as more and more people leave. And then finally, we also have government policies as well that are kind of leading into why are people moving our cities so much. Um, so let's talk about urban blight. Again, urban blight, while it starts as an effect, right, something that comes from urban sprawl, it also leads to further urban sprawl. So urban sprawl is always number one, the first thing that happens. Urban blight usually comes number two, but then further urban sprawl is going to happen because of urban blight. So let's talk about that. This is a positive feedback loop. And remember from climate change that positive feedback loop does not mean good, right? Positive feedback loop as opposed to negative feedback loop means getting bigger, 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 stronger, 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 more and more intense. Whereas a negative feedback loop, when we go off of homeostasis, Negative feedback loops bring us back into medium. It brings us back to a controlled level. Positive feedback loops, bigger, 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 stronger, stronger, stronger. So what happens is, right, people leave to and move to the suburbs, okay? They go to the suburbs, they're like, hey, 
super cheap to live out here. Let's go move to McKinney. I don't know, that's Dallas, but anyways. When more and more people leave, that means we have less tax revenue actually going into the city itself. Less taxes means we have less services. We start cutting transportation, we start cutting parks, we start cleaning or cutting, uh, cleaning janitorial services. Less services mean people don't wanna be there. So fewer customers, businesses leave because there's not as many services, people aren't being able to visit those services. So that means our neighborhood declines. With the declining neighborhoods, people are like, oh, I don't really want to live here anymore. It's not so great to live here anymore. So then more and more people move to the suburbs. More people move to the suburbs, less taxes, less services, less businesses, neighborhood declines, and so on and so on and so on. So while urban sprawl is the first thing that started, this urban blight cycle, this positive feedback loop, does lead to further urban sprawl. And we'll talk a little bit about how uh, another one talks about government policies and highway construction, how that also ties into this urban sprawl. So hold on to this for a second. Um, government policies as well have not only, uh, really they've, they've kind of created this urban sprawl, um, but we're also kind of seeing this urbanization as well. So I'm gonna really focus on this highway trust fund. All three of these are very important. We'll talk more about multi-use zoning in a second, but this highway trust fund is, is a big one. And I do have a graphic for highway trust fund as well. Um, essentially, this was a federal gasoline tax that pays for the construction and maintenance of roads and highways. So this ended up, and it, it really is, I mean, it is a good thing, but all good things have a cost, right? So this ended up starting as a good thing because we said, hey, we want to beautify our roads. We want to build more roads. We want to help people get around. We want to help people get to Costco and get to Trader Joe's and be able to tra travel to all these places to help business and revenue increase, right? But with greater access to highways, more and more people are going to be leaving, okay? Um, and this is also gonna to lead to further urban sprawl. So let's hold on to zoning, I'll tell you zoning for a second. This is a, talking about that highway trust fund. So our suburbs expand, more and more people leave. A lot of people are also gonna be leaving because we're building these highways, right? And with the increased access of highways, um, because people are experiencing more and more traffic congestion. And really, it's, it's, it used to only be in Houston, but now we're experiencing more and more traffic congestion in spring. And I'm, I, this is happening real time because I mean, we're here in spring, right? Because we have this increased traffic congestion, I hear it all the time. People are like, I'm moving to Conroe. I'm moving to Lake Conroe. I'm moving to, I think it's Buda, Buda. Buda I think it's Buda, right? It's right in between us and Austin here at Houston and Austin, and people are moving out further and further away. Why? Because as the suburbs have expanded, more and more people are coming to spring, which means now the congestion, the traffic that was only in Houston is now in spring as well. People don't like these commutes, and they also don't like, oh my gosh, I'm using all this gas. So that's going to be increasing tax revenues. But now that we have more taxes, cool, let's build more highways. That means people are going to be moving out, and people are also going to be moving out because they don't like this traffic congestion. So all this to say, it's another positive feedback loop that's causing this greater amount of urban sprawl. We're on our last point, I promise. I know this has been, I always say it's gonna be short and then it ends up being, I guess I have a lot to say. How do we try to combat this? How do we try to decrease the creation of highways? How do we try to decrease the spreading and spreading and the growing and growing? Because right, the spreading and growing is leading to greater use of gasoline. Gasoline is a fossil fuel, increasing those greenhouse gases in our environment. So how do we try to mitigate this? How do we try to decrease this? Well, there's something known as smart growth. And smart growth, actually, we are seeing um, here in Houston a lot. Uh, and I bet you you're going to see a lot of these that are very true for Houston right now. Uh, we're trying to keep people back in the city. We're trying to increase the young population staying and coming, well, coming to and then staying in the city of Houston to try to combat urban blight, to try to combat all this growth and this increased traffic congestion. These are 10 steps to try to keep people in these urban settings and to try to decrease that deterioration of the neighborhood as people move out into the suburbs. Mixed land use or mixed land zoning, this is gonna be whenever individual areas, it's not only um, business. Okay, let me, okay, you've seen those buildings, right? The business on the bottom, apartments in the middle, and on the top, maybe there's like a park or a grocery store or something like that. Mixed land use is we don't have land just for one thing or another. Let's have a whole bunch of things at once. Let's use this land efficiently rather than an all for one, one stop shop. Um, I won't go through all of these, but some big ones, we talked about mixed land use, we want walkable neighborhoods, 
We want compact buildings. Let's make our communities beautiful. Let's have open space, natural beauty. Let's make sure everything, let's make sure there's parks in these areas. We also wanna make sure that there's transit oriented development. Let's develop in a way that goes along those metro lines, that goes along our bus lines, that helps people not have to drive as much. Let's make sure that we have this increased access to public transportation. We want to continue developing our urban growth areas. Um, you could also, instead of spreading out that area, try to keep it inside by having urban growth boundaries. I know Portland, Oregon utilizes this, these urban growth boundaries. We also want to make sure everything's predictable, fair, and cost effective. You did it. You did it, you did it, you did it, which means we're ending things off with a joke and a riddle. Why are mountains funny? Because they are hilarious. <laughs> Oh my gosh, there's so many jokes. Why aren't koalas considered bears? Because they don't have the qualifications. Oh my gosh, and we got a reel for today. You can hold it without using your hands or your arms. What is it? What is it? Think about it. But I did want to let you know that you are the coolest. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for hanging out with me. And I will see you guys in class. Take care.